In this module, we'll focus on a particular part of the safety net, one that has been the subject of a great deal of scrutiny and policy attention. The Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, or TANF program, began in 1996 following major welfare reform legislation. This legislation, the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act, ended the Aid to Families with Dependent Children, or AFDC program, which was an entitlement. Its status as an entitlement program meant that the federal government agreed to fund benefits for all eligible AFDC recipients, and those recipients could generally expect to continue receiving those benefits. TANF, in contrast, is funded through a block grant from the federal government to the states. The block grant provides a fixed amount of money that states use for the purposes of TANF, but they have great flexibility in exactly how they use the funds, who they serve, and what services they provide. Legislation also established the broad purpose of the TANF program. Specifically, TANF aims to provide assistance to needy families with children, to end dependency on welfare by promoting job preparation, work, or marriage, to prevent and reduce out-of-wedlock pregnancies and the resulting single-parent families, and to promote the formation and maintenance of two-parent families. The TANF program, consistent with these multiple purposes, is both our primary cash welfare program for families with children, but is also far more complex than many similar or prior transfer programs. States were encouraged to experiment with new services and rules that attempt to meet the broad goals of TANF. States also maintain the ability to determine specifically which families they serve and set income eligibility levels. In California, for example, Income for a family of three must be below roughly $1,137 per month to be eligible for TANF, or CalWORKs, as the TANF program is known in California. This monthly income amounts to less than 75% of the federal poverty threshold for a family of three. Federal law also requires that states limit total lifetime use of TANF to no more than five years. Many states set stricter time limits of between two and five years. Up to 20% of a state's caseload can be exempt from this requirement. Finally, federal law prohibits legal immigrants from receiving federal TANF dollars until they have been in the U.S. for at least five years. Individuals in the country illegally are not eligible. Some states, including California, use state funds to provide benefits to legal immigrants who have been here for less than five years. Benefit levels are also set by the states. Generally, states establish a maximum benefit or grant level for a given eligible family size. Benefits are reduced below the maximum level for families that have substantial earned or unearned income. This is sometimes expressed as a high marginal tax rate on earnings for TANF recipients. This refers not to a formal tax, but to the reduction in total income that occurs as TANF benefits are reduced. This shows a worksheet used by California TANF recipients. In California, up to $225 in monthly earnings is allowed without any benefit reduction. Above that level of earnings, every additional dollar earned results in a TANF benefit reduction of 50 cents. In this example, an individual earning $600 a month would have her benefit reduced by 0.5 times 600 minus 225, or roughly $187. Thus, rather than receiving the maximum benefit of $714 a month, such an individual would receive $714 minus $187, or approximately $527 a month. You may want to pause here and make sure you understand, using this example, how the earnings disregard and earnings reduction works. There is no similar allowance for unearned income before benefit reduction begins. Thus, every dollar of unearned income, with some specific program exceptions, reduces TANF benefits received dollar for dollar. A major feature of the 1996 welfare reform legislation was that TANF recipients must participate in a work-related activity or face sanctions of some type. The law specifically requires that half of all participants in a state must engage in work-related activities for at least 30 hours per week or 20 hours per week for those with very young children. States can be subject to a lower than 50% work participation requirement in exchange for reducing their total TANF caseloads below the levels in 1994-95. A number of different activities, including several different types of employment arrangements, are considered to be work-related activities under TANF. 
The financing of cash welfare also changed dramatically with the transition to TANF. The federal government now sets funding levels for the states for TANF for many years at a time. In fact, the main federal funding sent to states for TANF has been fixed at a total of $16.5 billion since 1996. In addition, states are required to spend an amount equal to approximately 80% of the levels they spent in 1994 each year, known as the state maintenance of effort spending. This amounts to roughly $15 billion in recent years. This was done largely to avoid a race to the bottom by the states after reform in which states could reduce the amount they contributed to TANF. There are some additional amounts of funding from the federal government to be used in times of a weak economy, such as the 2008 recession, and for states with rapid population growth, which could raise their cost and their caseloads. These pictures show, in both nominal and real or inflation-adjusted dollars, total spending on TANF since 1997. The amounts spent on TANF differ slightly from the fixed amounts allocated each year. This is because states can sometimes carry forward unspent amounts from earlier years and because of some of the short-term emergency funding provisions. This slide shows that the total spending can be divided into a number of different components reflecting different uses of funding within TANF. While most people think of a welfare program as mainly providing cash assistance, and this is the largest category of TANF spending, shown in dark blue at the bottom of the figure, you can also see that other parts of TANF, including work supports and other purposes, account for a large fraction of overall spending as well. As shown here in 2013, basic assistance, or the income that is provided directly to poor families under TANF, accounted for just 28% of total TANF expenditures. This raises the point that the legislation actually established additional purposes for TANF beyond providing income support. Specifically, TANF has the broad mandate to end dependency on welfare and to support work readiness, marriage, and avoidance of out-of-wedlock pregnancy. This highlights an important tension in TANF and in many safety net programs. Are these programs intended to provide immediate relief from inadequate resources and raise family incomes above the poverty line? Or should safety net programs also aim to change the individual's and family's circumstances so that they will not need assistance in future periods? In the case of TANF, it is clear that both purposes are part of their legislative mission. This map shows that states often spend a fair amount of their total TANF budget on items that focus on the pregnancy, marriage, and other parts of its mandate. Note that in this year, only three states, shown with the darkest shading, spent more than 75% of their funding toward basic assistance and related work support and childcare services. Two decades have now passed since TANF was created and our old cash welfare system reformed. Because this is because a substantial amount of time has now passed, many researchers have studied TANF and asked the question of whether it is an effective part of the safety net, or at least whether it is more effective than the program it replaced. This is a complicated question to answer for a number of reasons. First, as we've seen, TANF has multiple purposes and it is not always clear what the overall goal of the reform or the program is. Is the goal to reduce poverty, reduce welfare use, increase employment, or discourage single parenthood? It is possible to reach very different conclusions if you believe the goal of TANF was to immediately reduce poverty, for example, than if you think the goal was to reduce welfare use or possibly reduce long-term welfare dependency. Second, however, it has also been challenging to evaluate the success of TANF because it occurred at a time when several other factors were changing that also affect poverty, employment, and related factors. First and foremost, the first few years following TANF's birth were a time of unusually strong economic growth. Poverty may have naturally fallen rapidly and employment among all groups increased. Similarly, there were, as we saw last week, major expansions in other parts of the safety net, including the earned income tax credit. It is difficult to know, for example, whether increased employment by single parents during the 1990s and after should be attributed to TANF, to the EITC, or to the overall robust economy. Finally, many of the positive changes in welfare use and employment that occurred after welfare reform actually appear to have started prior to the reform in 1996. This will be seen in several of the following graphs. Here, for example, 
it's clear that TANF caseloads fell after 1996 and have stayed relatively low. It is also clear, however, that this decline was already underway prior to 1996. In the case of poverty, there's no clear pattern if we compare poverty rates before versus after welfare reform. Here, for example, we see a slight increase in poverty, regardless of the measure used, from 1996 to 2014. One of the most often cited signs of TANF success comes when we look at employment rates of single or never married mothers. As shown here, this employment rate among TANF's target population grew dramatically after 1996. As with welfare caseloads, however, we also see that this may have started prior to the reform. A criticism of TANF, and one that remains controversial, is that it may have reduced support to the poorest individuals. TANF's emphasis on work readiness may make it less attractive and a less accessible program for poor individuals who also have significant barriers to employment, such as disability or serious illness. Researchers Catherine Eden and Luke Schaefer argue that, as a result, the rate of extreme poverty may have increased in the aftermath of welfare reform. Other researchers, however, argue that it can be very difficult to get reliable income data at the extremes of the income distribution. In particular, surveys may not do a good job of cap capturing the income sources and levels of support of the very poor, who may have multiple informal sources of support that are harder to capture with conventional surveys. This issue remains an important one for continued study. Overall, there's evidence that TANF, likely with help from other program expansions and a strong economy, succeeded in moving more single mothers into employment and reducing cash welfare use, but relatively little evidence that it lowered poverty or substantially improved total income. This module has focused on one of the most prominent cash welfare programs. Although TANF serves a relatively small fraction of the poor, it receives a great deal of attention and is a complex program. TANF provides cash assistance and requires for most of its recipients work-related activity. Like many means-tested programs, TANF benefits fall often deeply for individuals as their earnings increase. In the next module, we'll focus on another complex but very different type of program for the poor, the Earned Income Tax Credit.